We are very privileged to have the exhibit Auschwitz not long ago, not far away here for the past seven months and remaining until the end of January 2024. When speaking about the Holocaust, President Reagan said, good and decent people must not close their eyes to evil, must not ignore the suffering of the innocent, must never remain silent and inactive during times of national crisis. Though now it is a dry scar, we cannot let the bleeding wound be forgotten. Only when it is personalized will it be real enough to play a role in the decisions we make. Those victims who could not be with us today do a vital service to mankind by being remembered, but we must be their vessels of remembrance. His words carry a timeless message, reminding us of the necessity of preserving history as a guide for our actions today and to protect the future. The Holocaust is a dark spot in human history and cruelty beyond comprehension. But it is also a testament to the resilience and strength of the human spirit when you meet the survivors. They can teach us about hope, love, forgiveness, and are symbols that anything can be overcome. Keep these words in mind and know that you all are being passed the torch from Selena today, and we are all now vessels of remembrance. Here is a brief introduction to this incredible woman and her fascinating story. Selena Karp was only eight years old when the Germans invaded her homeland of Poland in 1939. After spending time with her family in hiding and then in a ghetto, she and her family were sent into slave labor and then a concentration camp. Selena spent several terrifying weeks at Auschwitz where she faced down the infamous Dr. Joseph Mengele before ultimately being saved by being on Oskar Schindler's list. When the war ended, she and her family eventually made their way to the United States, but she kept her Holocaust experience a secret because the years were too terrible to describe and she didn't believe anyone would understand. That all changed with the release of Steven Spielberg's film, Schindler's List, which brought the Holocaust and the story of Schindler to millions around the world. The movie prompted Selena to confront her painful past and begin speaking publicly about it. She has said in interviews, Oscar Schindler gave me my life, but Steven Spielberg gave me my voice. For those who haven't seen the movie or aren't familiar, Oscar Schindler was a German industrialist, black market profiteer and Nazi party member who saved the lives of 1,100 men and women during the Holocaust by employing them as his enamelware and ammunition factories workers. An opportunist initially, motivated by profits. Schindler, though, came to show extraordinary initiative, tenacity, courage, and dedication in saving his Jewish employees' lives through bribes, gifts, and whatever it took. But he is only one character in this story about a young woman who survived, but more importantly, the story of someone broken by evil who learned to heal, love, teach, and remember. Please help me welcome Selena Karp Biniaz. Okay, audience, Selena, Selena, audience. Good morning. <laughs> it is always a privilege to hear a living survivor. There are few left, and we'll talk about how there's even fewer uh, remaining from Schindler's List. But let's start at the beginning, Selena. Would you mind sharing with our audience a little bit about your life prior to World War II and growing up in Krakow, Poland? be delighted. I was, uh, when the war broke out, I was uh, eight years old. I had just finished my second grade. My parents were both, we lived in a very mixed neighborhood, very middle class. My parents were both accountants and we enjoyed our life, was, hired a lot of friends. There was no problem. 
I lived in a very nice apartment. Everything was going very, very well till the war broke out. And we were then uh, slowly moved incrementally from our nice neighborhood to another neighborhood, then from another neighborhood to the ghetto. And as uh, Megan told you, from the ghetto to various concentration camps. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened to me, I mean, through my father, really, because as he was an accountant, one of his accounts before the war was a sewing factory that will play an important part in our lives later on. So, nice. so before you were forced into um, the ghetto and then into slave labor concentration camps, what was the last grade you completed in school? And what kind of student were you? Well, I was finished my second grade. And after that, all the schools were closed and then slightly reopened, but only for the Catholic population, not for the Jews. So I no longer went to school from then on till I was liberated and I was 13 years old. So I lost five years of schooling. Now, many of you in here can think, being grateful for school, but this is a common theme throughout Selena's life. As you'll hear, her longing for learning, her quest for education, um, and really feeling remiss, that was the biggest sacrifice that she made at that young of an age, was her education, which you're very fortunate, your family very much valued your education, which we'll hear about. So um, as we're talking now about you know, uh, Germany invades Poland, the war, war breaks out. What were your biggest fears at the time as you started getting forced into, from your very nice apartment, then downsizing, and then keep getting to, to worse and worse conditions until eventually you were in the ghetto in Krakow? Well, the primary emotion that we all experienced was fear. Fear of not knowing what was gonna happen next. And in terms of my losing my school, I just wanted to tell you, I know many times you say to yourself, oh, I wish I didn't have to go to school today. I wish I didn't have to take that test. I fully understand that, believe me. But if something is truly denied to you, completely denied, and you're told you can't do it, you start really craving it, really wanting it, just because you want to be with your friends, because you want to learn, but also because you want to force the idea on other people. Hmm. So as the ghetto was being liquidated, as we talked about when Krakow, um, tell us a little bit about what your family was going through and what that was like as far as some fears and what you were experiencing. Well, eventually we were interned in the ghetto with a shared apartment with another family. My parents, as I told you before, my father's uh, one original uh, place that he was an accountant for was a sewing factory. That sewing factory was taken over by an entrepreneur from Vienna and started making uniforms for the German army. As such, it was allowed to use Jewish workers from the ghetto because they were involved in a war effort. Because my father was very knowledgeable about the factory, he ended up managing the factory for Mr. Madridge. Eventually, both my mother and I ended up working at that factory, my mother as a bookkeeper and myself on a sewing fact machine. But prior to that, while we were still in the ghetto, I was only 11 at that point. And as an 11-year-old, I was not allowed to leave the ghetto for any kind of work. So my parents must have bribed somebody to change my age to 13, I got false papers, really. And that gave me a card 
called the blue card or the blau shine in German, to allow me to leave the ghetto to join them at the factory. My parents were very afraid that every day that they left for work that they may not find me alive, you know, when they came back because there were selections all the time in the ghetto where older people, infirm, and specifically children, were gathered and shipped off. While I was in the ghetto, I need to tell you that the children that were there continued to work. I worked at a, what you call an envelope cooperative, where we made envelopes by licking together pieces of paper. Another cooperative that I worked for was a brush company that we made, we put in the bristles and the pre-cut or pre-drilled holes in a piece of wood and made brushes that way. But when my parents finally got me to go out, I was definitely uh, in a better state, being able to leave the ghetto at least for a day. Mm. So it was really Mr. Madrich that got you into a factory right, and working. Exactly. And then as it goes from Madrich over to Schindler, so just a quick audience poll. How many of you prior to watching the trailer for Schindler's List have heard of Oscar Schindler before today? Ah, oh, excellent. So many young people, no offense older people, but so many young people, that's great to hear. Um, so let's talk about when you heard of Oscar Schindler and when did you first hear about him? Was it from Mr. Madrich who was telling you about uh, he was moving his workers to a Schindler factory? What were your feelings when you heard about Mr. Schindler and that transition over to his factory? Well, when the ghetto was finally liquidated, we were all moved at that point into the plush of concentration camp, which is on the outskirts of Krakow. And uh, we continued working at the factory during that time. Mr. Schindler started a factory, took over an enamel factory uh, in Krakow, I mean, actually on the outskirts of Krakow, and, that made, and he made mess kits for the German army. And because he was making mess kits for the war effort, he also was able to use Jewish workers from the ghetto. When the ghetto was liquidated and we were moved then into Plashev, uh, we actually, the, our sewing factory was also moved into the concentration camp behind a barbed wire. We continued that way for about, oh, the ghetto was liquidated in March of 1943, and it, we did not, the, the camp did not become closed, really. I mean, there was an order that came in about the end of summer of 1944, because the Russian army was moving through Poland and liberating it. The order came through to liquidate the, uh, the concentration camp. It was at that point that Mr. Schindler had an epiphany, really, because he decided he was going to save all his workers. He was going to create a new munitions factory in Czechoslovakia, and he was going to take his workers there because he realized at that point, I think, that the war was almost over, and if he did that, he might be able to save them. He got permission from the commandant of the camp to take 1,100 workers with him. He started working on a list, the famous now Schindler's List. There were 300 women and 800 men. He approached Mr. Modridge because the two of them had become exceedingly good friends uh, because they worked on the same areas, you know, worked with the bribing the same German people, etc. So he asked Mr. Madrid, would he like to join him, move his factory also to Czechoslovakia. But Mr. Madrid, who was from Vienna, and an exceptionally decent human being, who really helped a lot of his workers during the time that we were in camp, 
decided he could see the end of the war coming to, and he didn't want to become involved in that project. So Mr. Schindler asked Mr. Modric, OK, put some of your people on my list. And that is what happened, how my family ended up on Mr. Schindler's list. Uh, actually, Mr. Modric put almost 300 people on Mr. Schindler's list. It's, so that's what happened. Hmm. Interesting, especially because many of you are older than Selena when she started working in these factories. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what was daily life like in the factories as we were talking in the green room a little bit about, you know, being 11 through 14. As well, at that working. point, I was, it wasn't, on paper, yes. I was 13. <laughs> uh -huh, that uh -huh. was the difference. Uh, it started with, you know, you had your cup of whatever it was, chicory coffee, supposedly, and a piece, a half a piece of bread, you know. We were all very hungry all along because provisions were very short. And then I worked on a sewing machine the entire day, you know, but that was what was going on in the factory. There was a different kind of life in, uh, uh, in the camp, because once you were back in the camp, it was a different sort of uh, experience. First of all, they gathered you at least three times a day to count you, to make sure that nobody has escaped. And usually that counting took about an hour, really, where you stood in a group of five, and they counted in the morning, at lunchtime, and in the evening. And that was pretty much, uh, I have to say that the predominant feeling in camp was always fear. I mean, there was fear of everything, of not knowing what's going to happen next. Hmm. So the Madrid factory closes, and even Schindler moves you all from one factory to another, which is how you end up in Auschwitz. Could you tell us about basically how that happened and your stint oh, at Auschwitz? At, so the list was formed of 1,100 people, 800 men and 300 women. Uh, at the end of September, the 800 men were placed in box guards and sent off. And of course, we didn't know where they went or what happened to them because then we had no communication whatsoever. Two weeks later, the 300 women were placed in boxcars and sent off. We traveled for about a day and a half, arriving at the place in the middle of the night. When the doors opened, we thought we were in Czechoslovakia at Schindler factory, but it turned out that we happened to be in Auschwitz. Well, you can well imagine, or you can't imagine, the kind of feelings and fear that penetrated everybody's heart, really. Uh, we had no idea why we ended up in Auschwitz rather than in Czechoslovakia. We ended up there for almost five weeks, doing all kinds of chores, and again, being counted three times a, uh, a day, a day <clears throat> very hungry, et cetera, uh, living to a 100 people to a barrack. Uh, some of you might have seen the barracks here. Uh, you know, five people to a berth. So it, it was, the situation was very terrible, really. Our jobs were usually such as cleaning the snow, because at that point already in November, and end of October, beginning of November, there is a lot of snow in Poland. And it was cold, and we would have to, uh, one of our jobs was cleaning the latrines. And then, of course, we were each day, we were fearful that we, barrack would be taken for selections, which also were going on at the same time. Now, in the selection, you stood in front of the doctor naked completely naked, and passed him. And if he thought that your body was in good shape and ready for work, 
your past and will save it for another time. If, he, if you had a blemish or anything on your body, that was not a good idea. You were sent to the left side and most likely to, the, to one of the furnaces. So one day, unfortunately, uh, when my mother volunteered to go and peel potatoes in the kitchen, because she felt that if she brought some peels back, that would feed us. I mean, she was going to hide it under her striped pajama. And uh, just so happened that day, the, uh, our barrack was taken for selection. Well, I got to meet Dr. Joseph Mengele, who was doing the count, you know, looking over and deciding who was still fit and who was not fit. We were all naked standing and passing him by in the line. And uh, he had a pencil in his hand. And if the pencil went to the left, you were not fortunate enough. If the pencil went to the right, you were spared. At first, when I passed him, the pencil went to the left. And I was in a group confined not to be fit to continue living. But uh, somehow he had a change in his mind and called that group once again to pass him through. My bo I was underdeveloped, but I was tall, skinny, but fortunately my body was absolutely clean. That was very important not to get any blemishes or any kind of sores on your body. This time when I p came up to him, I have no idea what prompted me or why I did it, but it must have been a form of survival wish because as I came up to him, I said three words to him. I said, lassen Sie mich, which is in German and implies let me go. He looked at me, pushed the pencil to the right, and of course I grabbed my clothes, ran out into the snow naked, trying and hysterically crying because I have just been given a reprieve on life from Dr. Mengele, the butcher of Auschwitz. Wow, what an incredible act of bravery for a young woman who was alone because, as you said, your, your father was with the 800 men, so you were separated from your father for many years, um, and then to be with her mom, who happened to not be there that day. So. Uh, the terror you must have felt of being alone and then facing this man who was known for torturing, testing, uh, and inhumane uh, acts on um, Jewish concentration camp inmates. Um, May so I mention something? Yes, please. <clears throat> As I got older and I thought about that situation, it made me think that what if my mother had been with me would I have depended upon her to save me rather than trying to save myself? And it sort of gave me a clue to parts of life. You can never predict how you would act in a certain situation. Truly, sometimes you say, oh, if it was me, I would do this, I would do that. You really don't know how you would act till it happens to you. And also, you can never walk in another person's shoes because you don't know what they are experiencing or why they are experiencing what they are experiencing. That is a great but point. But that's later, you know, as I got brighter and smarter. <laughs> and I do want to add one other note, which is hopefully when you arrived today, you saw that we have a very important artifact here in front of the museum front gates, which is we actually have one of the box cars that transported Jewish family members like Selena and her family in front of the museum. So I hope that that resonates with you because that is an important artifact from history that gives insight to the people who suffered in them. So um, let's talk about when the camps were liberated in 45 and what happened to the Karp family. Uh, especially, I would love for you to talk about saying goodbye to Mr. Schindler, who by that time 
felt a great affinity and love for the 1,100 people that he felt responsible for, and he ensured their safety and survival. So please tell us about um, when he left, and then also when you all left. Well, when we were liberated on May 9th, 1945, by the Russian army, actually the uh, date for the end of war in Europe is May 8th. But we were waiting for the Russian army to come and to our spot to liberate us. But we knew that we had to do something for Oskar Schindler and his wife, Emily, because if the Russian army were going to meet them or see them, they were definitely going to kill them. After all, he was a Nazi. They would not listen to our explanations of what he did. So it was decided that two of the young men we're going to take Mr. and Mrs. Schindler in their car and drive them during the night to the American zone in Germany. It was figured that the Americans would certainly be more welcoming to him, especially if the young men were going to tell, you know, of his efforts on the part of the Jews. So um, Mr. Schindler gathered us on the, uh, in the factory, on the floor of the factory. It was a very emotional feeling. He had tears in his eyes, hoping, wishing that he had had more money, that he had done more, that he could have saved even more people. Several of the young men, I don't know whether they were young or old, several of the men had contributed uh, dental gold, and one of the goldsmiths created a ring for Mr. Schindler with an inscription on the inside saying, who saves one life saves the world entire. And it was presented to Mr. Schindler. But before he was leaving the factory that he took over and made into a munitions factory was a cloth factory. And there were some remnants of all kinds of cloth and sewing implements and stuff like that. He made sure that every family received a package of remnants like that so they could be used as a barter, you know, because we had no money on our way back to our former domiciles, which would have been Krakow, Poland, or other parts of Poland. So um, my family received two bolts of cloth and five pairs of scissors, which we did use for all kinds of things, mainly when we got to Poland to hire a tutor for me. Hmm. One thing you mentioned that I just want to go back to briefly, as you talked about the state of your health being vital for your survival in a concentration camp, was that you actually got several illnesses and diseases while you were in camp survived them, and then you brought up uh, Mrs. Schindler, and I'd love for you to tell us about being in the infirmary and how you were nursed back to health. Well, originally in, in, in the flash of concentration camp, unfortunately, I came down the scarlet fever, ended up in the hospital, worked through that, but the hospital, of course, was not under total hygienic situation, so I picked up <laughs> typhoid, and after typhoid, I ended up with uh, jaundice, which was with me for quite a while, and which affected, my, because of malnutrition, affected my liver. So when I was finally at Mr. Schindler's factory, uh, one of the things that I ended up in the infirmary at one point because my liver started acting up, and Mrs. Schindler was incredible in helping Mr. Schindler really save the people. She used to forage all over the farms in the winter to pick up all kinds of winter vegetables that uh, could be put into our meager soup, you know, like rutabaga and squash and other things. But she herself would come in every morning at 10 o'clock with a pot of what she called farina, which I think it's a form of oatmeal or something like that, that she had cooked herself and filled our 
little meager bowls with it, but that little meager you know, amount really made a huge difference because we were extremely hungry. So I do owe Mrs. Schindler an additional thank you for saving my life. Hmm. That is a nice story. Um, so let's talk about where your family went. You, you said you had this care package of the uh, bolts of cloth and scissors because remember they had nothing to start a life with. They're free now, but they have nothing to build upon. So you take that and then um, you move from there and let's talk about you going back to Germany and then where your family ends up, how you reunite with your dad um, and your, your family unit moves out of the camp. Well, uh, first of all, we go back to Poland. Mm. All right, and, and use some of the stuff that we have to hire a tutor. Don't forget, I've only had two years of education. I could read, but I couldn't write. I hadn't had a pencil or a pen in my hand in five years. It is the summer, fortunately, and so I have plenty of time to try and learn as much as I can. My head is empty, there's nothing there. So everything I learned sticks in, fortunately. Yeah. By the end of the summer, I take the entrance exams to a girls' high school. Uh, one other Jewish girl and myself pass, and we are entered. And, but on, unfortunately, uh, that, one that one month, just last one month, it was great, really, to be able to have friends and to have nice teachers. But unfortunately, there were all kinds of insurrections against Jews at the end of, the, of September because it was the Jewish holidays in the eastern part of Poland. And my parents had decided at that point that uh, there was not really a, a place for us in Poland after that. And also because during the summer, uh, we've already heard from our family on the outside of Europe, that they have started all kinds of uh, projects, you know, to bring us out of Europe. So my parents decide, okay, we leave Poland. We end up back in Czechoslovakia, and after two weeks traversing Czechoslovakia, we end up in the American zone, where we originally ended up in a uh, displaced persons camp, but my mother had said, she had enough of camps, so now <laughs> it was arranged for us to requisition two rooms from a German lady in a small little town called Mindelheim outside of, in Bavaria, outside of Munich, and that's where we moved. And we moved there on Russian cards and also packages from the United Nations Relief Organization which were wonderful. There were all kinds of good things in them. Cocoa, chocolate, soap, cigarettes, uh, everything that the Germans have not seen in all the years of war. Not that we were gonna use them, but we were gonna use them as a barter again for my education, because now I have just gotten caught up in Polish, but now I'm in Germany, I don't know the German language, and I don't know the curriculum of the schools. So I'm behind what's known. <laughs> I can't go to school again. I have to be privately tutored again. And that's what continues for the next two years in Germany. Yes, I'm glad we get to this, because this is a key role, uh, a key person in your life. So in your book, Saved by Schindler, shameless plug here, um, which we'll talk about as well. Um, you talk about the importance of forgiveness and that hatred is corrosive to yourself. This is so important today that we hear this and we talk about this. Will you share your thoughts on this and how a German Catholic nun healed you as a broken and bitter 14, 15, and 16 year old, which is the age of many of you out here, which doesn't go unnoticed by Selena and I, um, that she was extremely um, angry and full of hatred after she got out of the camp. So please tell us about that. Well, I ended up in Germany 
as I said, again, not being able to go to school, I was bitter, I was angry, I was upset over my new situation. I just felt like my life was at the end, really. Uh, I, I appreciate that I was alive, but there was no movement forward. But fortunately, the one good thing that happened in that town, that there was a semi-cloister, which was a school, a finishing school for German girls where they learn all kinds of domestic things, you know. But at that particular cloister was a retired English teacher, a nun, who entered the cloister when she was 16 years old, and she never left. And it was arranged for me to take my German and English lessons with her. She was the first person. Now, she was in her 80s at that point. She, treated, she was the first person after the war that treated me with dignity, that treated me as a child who needed help. She could have hated me because she was German and she was Catholic. And according to Nazi propaganda, that was the way. But that was not her. Aside from teaching me English and German, she worked with me many, many days that I saw her on getting rid of hatred and anger. She showed me how corrosive hatred can be because it does not hurt the person that you hate. It hurts you. It prevents you as a person from moving forward in your life. And she also taught me that you, it's OK to remember. You mustn't forget things that you've experienced, but you have to learn to forgive. Because if you don't forgive, you cannot move forward. You have to work through your problems, because life is not going to be yours unless you do that. So I credit her, truly for showing me a way to move forward in my life. So I stand, stayed with her for two years. Then at 16, when we left for the United States, I corresponded with her for another two years, and I still have all her letters. She was a very important person in my life. Hmm. We have some pictures from Selena that we're going to do in the break between this conversation and the Q&A when we hand it over to you. So you'll see the picture of Selena at 16 with Mater Leotine, if I, right. I do not speak German, so that's my best attempt. Um, okay, so you are on the road to healing and um, letting go of a lot of hatred, um, and you receive notice that your family is now going to America, Iowa specifically, um, but we'd love to hear about your uncle and his determination to get you to America, to Iowa, where he was living, and out of war-torn Europe. So what was it like, that part, and when you landed in New York and then headed to Iowa? Please tell well, us about that. <clears throat> on my 16th birthday, I boarded a ship that was going to take me to my new life. It was the SS Marine Marlin, which was a decommissioned army ship. And as such, it did not have individual cabins. It had several large cabins for about 60 people at a time. It did not have individual berth. It had hammocks, like three in a row, that you slid into for your night. They were comfortable. But unfortunately, every time the ship moved, <laughs> the hammock moved. <laughs> And a lot of the people uh, sleeping in those things got seasick, very much so. I, unfortun I fortunately was not seasick, and I kind of ended up eating everybody's ice cream, which was really <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, it took us 11 days to traverse uh, the Atlantic Ocean. We ended up in New York, and that to me was just an incredible sight. We had left Germany, which 
looked at that point somewhat like what you see pictures of Ukraine now. You know, devastated, broken, lots of rubble around. But New York, with its neon signs and all the electricity and the pulsating life and Times Square was just another vision altogether. My uncle drove from Des Moines, Iowa to, in a car to take us back with him because he's the one that sent us the affidavits to bring us back, to bring us over to the United States. It took us three days to drive from New York to Iowa. And I, couldn't, I marveled at the vastness of the United States without really realizing just how vast the United States was beyond Iowa. You know. When we got to Des Moines, one of the, again, important things was my education, because I had not gone to school again. And it is now more than five years. It's now seven years that I haven't gone to school. So, uh, Fortunately, I brought all my notebooks and my books and my papers with me. And so they were presented to the North High School in Des Moines for them to look and figure out where would I fit in. Well, apparently I covered enough material, so I entered the 12th grade. So I went from second to 12. <laughs> <laughs> kind of easy if you can do it. Uh, I had a wonderful year, one of my best years, really, that I consider, because I, had, I, was, I was leading a normal life. Uh, my parents both got jobs right away, because I always say accounting is an international language. You don't need to know either German, you don't need to know English. All you have to know is how to do the books. So they got jobs right away. We lived for a while with my uncle, and uh, another lucky thing that came for me was the girls' advisor. I don't think they have them nowadays in high schools, but at that time there was a girls' advisor in a high school. She happened to have been a graduate of Grinnell College, and she made it her mission that I should continue my education at Grinnell College. She drove me there with all my records and everything, persuaded Grinnell College to give me a full academic scholarship and a work program. I went to Grinnell for four years, graduated there in 1952, and I always say I owe a great big debt to the state of Iowa for educating me and for making my parents so welcome there. Mm. They talk about, in your book, um, reestablishing their life, which they said would have been impossible without Absolutely. the community. Yeah. Um, so you go to Grinnell, and then you are academically successful. You're glad to be back in school. And now you are um, getting accepted to these very prestigious programs, in, which leads you to New York, where you eventually uh, go to school. You start to build. A, a life, you build you know, a marriage, a career, uh, and a family there. Um, before all that begins, tell us about what programs in New York, going, ending up at Columbia, and getting your master's, I know, comes later, but being in New York and building a life. Well, I went to Columbia Teachers College. I got my master's, but <laughs> you wouldn't believe this, probably. But at that time, in the early 1950s, you could not teach in the city of New York if you spoke with an accent. <laughs> How things have changed, right? Because <laughs> now you hear all kinds of accents. But I met my husband, I got married, we ended up on Long Island, I lived there, I was a, a stay-at-home mom for a while, and then when my, I had two children, a son and a daughter, I never talked about any of my experiences because I never felt that anybody would understand them. I was known in my community as a DP or a displaced person, that I couldn't go back to the country of origin. Not that I ever wanted to go back, but that was the situation. Then when my children finally were in elementary school, I 
started teaching. And I, I worked with the youngsters who had real difficulty, for whatever reason, learning the uh, stuff in their classrooms. And so uh, I bonded with them very well because I surely could understand where they were coming from and how they felt about their inability to be successful. Uh, I, caught, I taught for 27 years, and that was the joy of my life, truly. I uh, loved teaching and being, and also being in an elementary school all those years made me feel like I was reliving my school, my childhood, you know, which I missed. It was great to hear testimonials again in the book from her students who said, I had no idea about her past, but she was such a warm, loving teacher who did the same as Mater Leotine did for her, the nun, that she gave back to hundreds, if not thousands of students and kind of fell into teaching because of her spirit and healing that she offered and helped students as she said, from all kinds of struggling backgrounds to succeed and excel in that. Um, so let's get to 1993 when Steven Spielberg produces an Academy Award winning, actually seven Academy Award winning film, Schindler's List, after a book which, uh, there's a fascinating story I hope we get to, um, which is how the book comes out and is inspired by a survivor of Schindler's List that Selena knows in LA. I'll tell it very quickly, which is his portfolio breaks while he's in LA at a writer's conference, correct me if I'm wrong, Selena, and he goes to a little shop on Rodeo Drive or owned by uh, Leopold Page, who is a survivor, and tells him, you know, you should write this, I got a story for you, which we all laugh, and um, ends up writing Schindler's List, the book, which then in 93, Spielberg gets a hold of, he's... Famous, anyone heard of E.T., Indiana Jones, right? So he is a well-respected, although more sci-fi at this point. And, uh, and the, the film highlights the story of these 1,100 Jewish people that Schindler put in his factory workers list, sparing them from death. So how did you feel when the movie came out? And once you saw the global reaction to the film and your story? Well, the first... Uh I was invited to the premiere showing at one of the LA movie houses, but I don't remember the name of it. Uh, when I first saw the movie, on, uh, saw my life on film, I really felt devastated because it brought back all kinds of incredible, I mean, it was so well done that it was, that made me feel I was still there, you know? But in a way, it was also very liberating because now for the first time, I had a point of reference. If somebody asked me, what was it like to be uh, in camp or to be liberated or whatever, I could say, if you watch Schindler's List, you will have a clue as to what my life was like, and then I can talk to you about it. So in that sense, uh, it was, Great, you know. And I started, um, Schilberg, um, Steven Schilberg then decided, uh, as he was filming this stuff in Krakow, people kept coming up to him and telling them, you know, I've got a story of survival. And he, at that point, he said, actually he said that sh doing the filming changed his life forever. It was a tremendous impact on who he was and what he thought. He decides at that point that he's going to collect as many testimonies of survivals as there are, possibly. Gives up his own money to start the Shoah Foundation. And Shoah means, uh, in Hebrew, is the word for genocide or holocaust. Uh, and he collects altogether, in various ways, 52,000 testimonies in 50, from 59 different countries in 34 different languages. And these testimonies are not just from surviving Jews. These are testimonies from Roma, from uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, from political prisoners, from the Catholic clergy, 
from anybody that survived the Nazi persecution. So it, they are incredibly moving and incredibly accurate, you know. So they are now as part of the archives of the Shoah Foundation, and they use it in their program, which they call teaching program, which they call Eyewitness, which is a visual educational program. It centers upon the fact that if a student in high school or in college wants to do a project on you know, how did somebody survive, let's say, buried under six feet of ground, you know, or behind a bookcase or whatever, they can click on that information and you can really read about the Holocaust in uh, books. You can see artifacts as here in the museums, but nothing really connects like the human voice. When, a pay, when you click on that information and a human face appears on your computer and talks to you and tells you exactly what it was like to survive. You know? So it's a very important program and it is used now all over the world and in various different places, including Australia and many, many uh, colleges and universities and high schools throughout Europe. Yes, the Shoah Foundation at um, USC. So any of you want to follow up, it's a great, yeah. you can incredible take a tour. You can yes. take a tour of the Shoah Foundation at USC. It's on the fourth floor of one of the buildings there. And you can see exactly the kind of work that they do. Okay, Selena, so we're coming to the end of our hour of my interview, and then I'm going to pass it over to all of you to be able to Time ask questions that... To drink. Yes, ask questions that you want to know more about. Um, but for our, our final questions, um, especially as you have these experiences from the Holocaust and how that influenced your outlook on life and hope, resilience, and forgiving people who inflicted the most grave sort of pain on your loved ones and yourself. So taking that message and ending us on a note of what advice, what message do you have for those of us here, especially young people in the audience, of what to take from you that they can chew on and think about and hopefully learn from today for the rest of their lives? Well, one of the things that I always talk about when I talk to high schools, which I have done a lot, uh, colleges and groups with young people because I have such an incredible faith in the young people. I believe and hope. I believe they are the best of our coming generation right now. But if you have a problem, you really have to face it. You can make it. If I could make it, I'm sure that if you work through it, please do not hate. Please accept people for what they are. Everybody has something good to offer. And that is the message that I always give to the young people. You need to work to try and emerge from whatever is bothering you. Things will get better. Always do. Oh, what a great message. And let's give a big round of applause for Selena.